Egiani, Bingalela Basalwani, Egameni Lakotsi Yetu, Jesu Christu. Hey, I said I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, thank you so much for the opportunity to come and open the Word of God with you today. I am so excited to be here and to share God's Word with you. Uh, now, I'm in my mid 30s. And uh, as I've been living my life, as I've been going through my journey, I've kind of noticed that the world around me, at least this has been my observation, you can tell me if you've had a different one, but I've felt like the world around me has become more sad and depressed. The world view of the people that I see around me seems to be becoming more and more negative as time goes by and as I become older. Um, I think no better example of this can be told than for me to just tell you a little bit about a very popular young adult author and children's author. His name is John Green, and he's written many popular books. Now, John Green, uh, when he was a younger man, was an avid Christian, passionate about his faith. He would go to church, and then all of a sudden he decided, you know what, I want to become a pastor. So he went to Bible school, and he was passionate about his faith at Bible school, so much so that he decided, look, I'm going to go and be a chaplain at a local hospital. He would sit with people in their darkest moments, and he would say, look, there is a God, there is hope. Listen to this, get excited. And so he was a passionate believer. But then John Green had a bit of a crisis of faith. Now, don't get me wrong. If you walked up to John Green today and you said, John Green, are you a Christian? He would say, yes, yes, I am a Christian. Christianity is great. I love going to church. I go to church. But what he would call Christianity and what we would call Christianity would be very different. He would be closer to what we may call universalist today, a universalist. Basically, he believes everybody goes to heaven. All religions lead to heaven. And the basic idea is it's good to get a religion. It's good to have a religion under your belt because it helps you live a moral life. You learn lessons, you learn how to be a good person. So just pick a religion, pick any random religion. And if you do that, you're gonna live a better life. You're gonna be a better person. After John Green had this crisis of faith, uh, he started becoming a more negative and darker person. His worldview darkened. And also around this time, he became famous. He became famous through a couple of different means, but one of the main ways that he became famous is he wrote many popular children's and young adult books. The most famous of those being a book called The Fault in Our Stars. The Fault in Our Stars. That book became so famous, they made it into a movie. And I've seen that movie. It's pretty good. It's a pretty good movie. I liked it. It was fun. It's a fun thing. It's about two young people, a guy and a girl, both teenagers. They both get cancer. And the whole book is about how they deal with that. How do they interact with their family? How do they interact with their friends? How do they deal with the horrors of cancer? And uh, then, of course, since it's a young adult book, they fall in love, and it's a romance. But the book itself is quite dark. The worldview that the book presents is a dark worldview. And I think the best way for me to show you that is to just read a short excerpt from the book. Now, this is an excerpt that the boy character is saying to the girl character. This is what he says. The problem is not suffering itself or oblivion itself, but the depraved meaninglessness of these things, the absolute inhumane nihilism of suffering. You see, the characters in the book, and John Green himself, and I would say culture as a whole is moving towards the worldview that's sometimes called nihilism. Nihilism. Nihilism is the belief that nothing we do, nothing that happens on Earth has any meaning. We're all just specks of dust floating on a slightly bigger speck of dust that's flying through space a million miles an hour. Who cares? Everything we do will eventually be forgotten in two generations. No one will even remember our names. Nothing has any meaning. Everything is worthless. Now, there is a book of the Bible that speaks about this topic. 
You probably know what book I'm going to say. Ecclesiastes, yeah, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is the book, and it's a great book. It details this worldview exceptionally well. And that's what we're going to be looking at for the duration of this sermon. We're going to do an overview of the book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to take an eagle-eyed view. We're going to look at how the author deals with these topics. We're going to think about it. We're going to see the conclusions that he comes to, and we're going to do this together. Now, when you speak about the book of Ecclesiastes, there is definitely a key phrase, a, a, a saying that is said over and over again in the book. In fact, it's said 28 separate times in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's basically the author's mindset, how he looks at the world, how he thinks about the world. That's the phrase, under the sun. Under the sun. So whenever you do a study of the book of Ecclesiastes, you need to always be thinking about this phrase, under the sun, because that's how the author thinks about the world. So what does it mean? What does it mean under the sun? So what does the sun touch? The earth. The sun touches the earth. So basically, the author of Ecclesiastes is taking the approach of what can I observe? It's a very surface level approach to the world. What does the sun touch? It touches us. We live our daily lives. We go about our business. We do things. As we do those things, the sun touches us. It's a very practical way to look at the world, a very surface way to look at the world. What can I observe? What can I do? What can I see? That's how the author of Ecclesiastes is approaching life in this book. And he takes a very negative approach. He has a very negative thoughts as he looks at the world around him. In fact, let's start off our reading of scripture today by just kind of getting an overview of how the author of Ecclesiastes thinks about the world. We're going to read from Ecclesiastes 1, 2 through 11. 1, 2 through 11. Now, if you would like to read along with me today, feel free, open up the book of Ecclesiastes, because everything we are going to read today is from that book. So if you have the book of Ecclesiastes open, you should be able to follow along with me, no problem. I'm going to be hopping around the book, but it's all going to be in that book. So open up the book of Ecclesiastes, and you'll be with me. Ecclesiastes 1, 2 through 11. Everything is meaningless, says the teacher. Completely meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run to the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again to the river and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are never content. History merely repeats itself. It has all been done before, nothing under the sun, there's that phrase, is truly new. Sometimes people say, here is something new, but actually it's old. Nothing is ever truly new. We don't remember what happened in the past, and in future generations, no one will remember what we are doing now. All right, that's the approach, that's the thought of the author of Ecclesiastes. He takes a very negative view of the world. He sees things very darkly. He says things like, look, the sun is going to rise and set no matter what I do. Nothing is going to change the fact that the earth is just going to keep spinning. The sun is going to keep rising and setting. Water is going to flow to the sea no matter what I do. Water just keeps going to the sea. The sea never fills up, though. Everything that we do is pointless. Then he even kind of gives a positive thing. He says, maybe you're one of these people that say, I've got a new idea. I've got something exciting, something new that no one's thought about before. But then immediately he says, no, there's no such thing as a new idea. If you think you have a new idea, someone has thought of that idea before a million times. 
Every thought has already been had. Every idea will just be repeated again in the future and has been thought of before. There is no such thing as being unique. Life is pointless. So the author of Ecclesiastes has kind of this dark approach to the world. Now, before we move on with the story of Ecclesiastes, I do think there's an important caveat that we need to think about. And that is to do with the author's key phrase, under the sun, under the sun. When we think of this phrase, under the sun, we need to realize in its basicness, in its fact that it's just looking at the practical, what you can see, what you can do, what you can hear, it excludes the supernatural. There is no inclusion of the supernatural. The book of Ecclesiastes does only think about the practical. Now, the supernatural includes God. God is not mentioned very much in the book of Ecclesiastes. The author of Ecclesiastes is attempting to see the world without God. So when you read the book of Ecclesiastes, it's useful to add the phrase, if there is no God. If there is no God, blank. If there is no God, blank. All the different things that are said, think about them with the phrase, if there is no God. Because the author of Ecclesiastes is trying to figure out if he can find meaning in life without God. If there is no God, is there any meaning to life? Or maybe, I know there is a God. I acknowledge God exists, but I want to live my life without God. Is that possible? Can I find fulfillment in my life ignoring God completely and just going about my life? That is the goal of the author of Ecclesiastes. And how does he do this? How does he go about this journey? Basically, he starts to try things. He goes from place to place to place. He tries to see, af one after another, if there's anything he can do in this life that will give him meaning. It's basically a journey. As you follow him on his journey to discover if there is anything meaningful in this life. And we're going to join him on that journey. We're going to do an overview. We're not going to read uh, all of the different things he tries. He tries a lot of things. We're going to check out a couple of the big ones. In fact, we're going to hit four of them. Four of the big things that he tries, and we're going to see what his thoughts are, what is the result of what he tries. And we're going to do that together today. Number one, the first thing he tries, wisdom. He's going to try wisdom. Read with me Ecclesiastes 1, 16 through 18. Ecclesiastes 1, 16 through 18. I said to myself, look, I am wiser than any kings who ruled in Jerusalem before me. I have greater wisdom and knowledge than any of them. So I set out to learn everything from wisdom to madness and folly. But I learned firsthand that pursuing all this is like chasing the wind. The greater my wisdom, the greater my grief. To increase knowledge is only to increase sorrow. So the first thing he tries is wisdom and knowledge. He tries to grow his wisdom and knowledge to become an exceptionally wise man and an exceptionally knowledgeable man. And as he does that, he says it's like chasing the wind. The wind is invisible and fast. So it's like chasing an incredibly fast, invisible thing. In other words, impossible, meaningless. Chasing wisdom without God, he finds, is meaningless. Now, I think it's important to talk about the author of the book at this point. Now, we're not 100% sure who the author of Ecclesiastes is. The book doesn't actually tell us who wrote it. Uh, there is some speculation. Most scholars would agree, and I would agree with them as well. Even the verse that we did re just read kind of hints at that, that it was King Solomon. If you remember in the verse we just read, it says, I'm wiser than any king that's come before me in Israel. So he seems to be calling himself a king. Most people agree it was most likely King Solomon. We're not sure, but it is it's it's what most scholars would say on the topic. If, in fact, the book 
of Ecclesiastes was written by King Solomon, that would greatly change this thing right here, the pursuit of wisdom. Now, why is that? Well, if I popped out on the street right now, I just walked out there right now, I found the first random person I could talk to, and went up to them and said, hey, tell me the first thing that pops into your head, if you think of King Solomon from the Bible, what are they going to say? Wisdom, wisdom. Wisdom is the most famous thing about King Solomon. In fact, before King Solomon became king, God came to him and he said, look, you're about to be king, I wanna give you a blessing. And King Solomon said, please give me the blessing of wisdom so I can be a better king. And God was shocked. God thought that he was going to ask for money or more land. And so God said, because you asked for wisdom instead of these more selfish things, I'm going to give you both. I'm going to make you wise and I'm going to make you rich. And then as we read the story of King Solomon through the Bible, as we learn his stories, most of them center around his incredible knowledge and wisdom. People would come from all over the kingdom to meet with him. People would come from the surrounding kingdoms. People would travel exceptional distances, and they would meet with him, and they would say, look, I'm having this problem. I'm having that problem. Here's the issue that I'm dealing with right now. Can you please help me? And King Solomon would use his exceptional wisdom to help them through whatever they were going through at that time. And so... If we keep that in mind, when we think of these verses, we can say that arguably the wisest man in the biblical account is saying that the pursuit of wisdom is like chasing the wind. Isn't that fascinating? And I think I understand why. I think the best way to describe it is to use an illustration. Uh, you may have seen it before. It's called the circle illustration. I think it explains things quite well. So here's how the circle illustration works. You've got a circle, right? And inside of the circle is everything you know. Everything you know in your life is inside of this circle. Everything you learned at school, your parents taught you, every single thing you know is inside of this circle. And on the outside of the circle, everything that touches the outside of the circle are the things that you know you don't know. That you know you don't know. For instance, let's say you say, look, I'm not very good at math. I don't know much about math. Yeah, I can do basic math, but I can't do super complicated math. So you would know, it would touch the outside, you would know that you're not very good at math. You don't know much about math, right? Or maybe you would say, look, I own a car. I know the basics about cars. Cars are great. But if my car breaks down, I'm going to have to take it to a mechanic. I don't know how to fix a car. So you would know, on the outside of the circle, you would know that you don't know how to fix a car. You know that you don't know something. That's how the outside works. Now, as you live your life, this circle grows because the amount of things you know increases. You go to school, you go to college, you get friends, you get life experience. You learn all these things and this circle gets bigger and bigger and bigger and you'll see that as the circle grows, the outside of the circle grows too. In other words, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. The more you know, the more you know you don't know. That's where the expression ignorance is bliss comes from. Basically, if you don't know anything, you don't know how much you don't know, so you're happy. That's, so, um, King uh, Solomon probably dealt with this as well, where he was a man that constantly sought after knowledge. He was going after knowledge. He wanted to be a wise man. But as he sought this knowledge, he realized there was always more knowledge to seek. There was always more things to learn. You never learned enough. You never could know enough. So knowledge outside of God is meaningless, like chasing the wind. Number two. Pleasure and work. Pleasure and work. Second thing he tries, pleasure and work. Let's go ahead and read chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and then we'll hop over to 18 through 20. Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and then we'll hop over to 18 through 20. I said to myself, come on, let's try pleasure. Let's look for the good things in life. But I found that this too was meaningless, so I said, laughter is silly, 
What good does it do to seek pleasure? I came to hate all my hard work here on earth, for I must leave it to others, everything I have earned, and who can tell whether my successor will be wise or foolish? Yet they will control everything I have gained by my skill and hard work under the sun. How meaningless. So I gave up in despair, questioning the value of all my hard work in this world. So the next thing that the author of Ecclesiastes tries is pleasure. He just goes out there and does whatever he wants. He doesn't care about the consequences. He doesn't care about anybody else's feelings. He just has as much fun as he possibly can. He's having parties, and he's drinking, and he's having sex, and he's just having a great time. But lo and behold, he finds it's laughable. He doesn't find joy in that. Now, I'm speaking to a church. I, I, I think probably a good number of you are Christians. I would assume that every single one of you in here would say, yeah, no, duh. <laughs> I mean, he just does whatever he wants. He doesn't think of the consequences, and it doesn't give him joy. Of course, we know that. We know that as Christians. We have example after example in the Bible of how living a selfish uh, uh, life that only cares about pleasure doesn't work. The Bible actually has a list of sins that are all about being careful with your pleasures and using your pleasures appropriately and godly. So I think we wouldn't argue with that at all. We would say, yes, of course, trying to just live a life of pleasure selfishly is stupid. But uh, did you catch what I said immediately afterwards? The thing he tries right after he tries pleasure, he tries hard work. Hard work. He says he gives this scenario where you use your, the sweat of your brow to build up a business. You use your skills. You use your talents. You use your hard work. You persevere. You do all these things and you build up a business, but then you die. And after you die, some idiot comes along, takes over your business, and runs it into the ground so what is even the point? Why is it valuable to even do hard work outside of God? Now, I think that this one's a little harder to swallow because we as Christians say, but that's a good value. That's a thing in the Bible that's uh, of value to us as a person. But I think the author of Ecclesiastes would argue even good things, even things we find valuable like hard work, perseverance, family, charity. If done without God, if done alone for its own purposes and not with God, is itself worthless. I think the best way to describe that is to talk about C.S. Lewis. He wrote an amazing book. It's called The Great Divorce. And I, uh, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Definitely read it. It's a short read. You can get through it in an afternoon. It is an amazing book. In the book, C.S. Lewis uh, draws this picture of a bunch of people that have died. He hops them into a bus, and this bus goes between heaven and hell. And while it's in heaven and hell, uh, they get to chat with some people, they get to talking, and they get to decide whether or not they want to go to heaven or hell in the end. Now, I don't think C.S. Lewis believed that you get one more chance to decide to go to heaven or hell when you die. I think he was using it as a framing device to help you to see the pitfalls on this earth that would stop you from going to heaven. And it's an excellent book. You get to see all these different conversations and how people deal with being in these different areas. One of the stories in the book is of a mother. And when she was a young mother, she had a baby. And pretty young, that baby dies. And the mother is, of course, heartbroken. She's saddened by the loss of her child. But then it becomes all-consuming for her. All she thinks about is the death of this child. She obsesses about it. She starts to ignore her friends and family. And eventually, she herself dies. And she's excited. She's in heaven now. And she thinks to herself, that's great. I'm going to get to see this baby that was taken from me. He's going to be in heaven. He's going to come. I'm so excited to finally get to see him. 
But instead of the baby, instead of the child that was taken for her coming to greet her, her brother, who had apparently also died, is there. And the woman is furious. She says, look, I've been waiting so long. I just want to speak to this child that's died. And let's read an excerpt. Let's read a bit of the conversation between her brother and her. The brother said, but Pam, do think. Don't you see you are not being at all as long as you are in this state of mind? You're treating God only as a means to your son. But you need to want God for his own sake. The mother replies, you wouldn't talk like that if you were a mother. The brother then says, you mean if I were only a mother? But there is no such thing as being only a mother. You exist as your son's mother only because you first existed as God's creature. That relationship is older and closer. No, Pam, listen. God also loves. He also has suffered. He also has waited a long time. To which the mother said, if he loved me, he'd let me see my boy. How dare you give me my boy? Do you hear? I don't care about all your rules and regulations. I don't believe in a God who keeps mothers and sons apart. I believe in a God of love. No one had a right to come between me and my son, not even God. Tell him that to his face. I want to see my boy. I mean to have him. He is mine, do you understand? Mine, 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 forever and ever. Her brother then tells her, he will be, Pem. Everything will be yours. God himself will be yours, but not that way. Nothing can be yours by nature. The mother says, what? Not my own son, born out of my own body? The brother replies, and where is your own body now? Don't you know that nature draws to an end? The mother screams, my son is mine. Sadly, the brother retorts, how yours? You didn't make him, and yet, Pam, you have no love at this moment for anyone else, not even your own mother or for me. I think C.S. Lewis does a really good job of painting this picture of how even good things, really good things, like the love of a mother for their child, become broken if they're put above God. When we place things above God, even the best things become meaningless and worthless. And in this case, even all-consuming and broken and negative. So, the second thing he tries, pleasure and work, are nothing without God. Let's try the third. Hardship. Hardship. Read with me 4, 1 through 3. 4, 1 through 3. Again, I observed all the oppression that takes place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed with no one to comfort them. The oppressors have great power and their victims are helpless. So I concluded that the dead are better off than the living. But most fortunate of all are those who are not yet born for they have not seen all the evil that is done under the sun. All right, so the author of Ecclesiastes kind of takes a break from what he's been doing up to this point. Uh, up to this point, he's been mostly trying things. He goes out and he does something. He sees if that thing that he does gives him meaning. But now he stops doing things and he observes things. He looks out into the world and he sees that everything is broken. There's badness in the world. Horrible things happen to good people all the time. And he concludes, it's better to have never been born than to live on this horrible, disgusting earth. Now, uh, this is a big topic, not certainly one that we can tackle today, especially since it really isn't the point of my sermon. 
Uh, some people even try to use this topic to say, look, there can't be a God because of all these horrible things that are happening. And I'm sure Pastor Dave has preached some amazing sermons on this topic. For the point of this sermon today, I think it is worth saying, though, that I think I agree with the author in this. If there is no God, maybe it would be better to never be born. Let me, let me give you a personal story. Um, there's a man in South Africa, his name is Kuba. He is an amazing Amazayoni man, true believer in Christ. He runs an Amazayoni church, a bunch of Amazayoni churches. He is the head of it. They all are Bible-believing, true churches. They're amazing. He also teaches at Zeb's, the Bible school that I teach at. He teaches multiple lessons. He has had an amazing impact on the ministry, a great man of God. Um, he works in KZN, which is not where I work, but I do know him personally because when I went to South Africa three years ago, uh, I went to live with him for a time, a couple of weeks, to help me with my language study, to help me learn Zulu better. So I lived with him. I got to know him super well. I ate with him. I chatted with him. I went out and lived his life with him. We were inseparable for multiple weeks. And also, I knew him from my childhood. He's a great guy, a godly, godly man. Now, he has multiple children, but for the sake of this story, I just want to tell you about his oldest son. In African culture and in Amazayoni culture, the oldest son is a very important person. You see, they pour extra resources like money and time, and they try to get them into good schools. They put a lot of effort into their oldest son, hopefully so that this person will get a leg up in life will have a little bit more money than their parents did, and will be able to support them in their old age. This oldest son is a very important person, and that was true of Cuba. He loved his oldest son, and his oldest son was a great, was a great young man. About two years ago, he was uh, driving as an Uber driver, and um, a couple of guys got into his car, and they decided they were going to uh, carjack him. They pulled him out of his car and they beat him within an inch of his life. They then stuck him into the trunk of the car and they sped away. Now, I don't know why, maybe because of the speed of their getaway, but they immediately crashed into a nearby tree. Because of this, and because he was in the trunk, barely alive already, he died. And you know, I think it's okay to ask the question, why would something so horrible happen to such a great guy? And maybe if there is no God, would it be better to never have been born? Let's look at the uh, fourth thing he tries. The fourth thing he tries is riches. Join me now in reading 5, 9 through 11. 5, 9 through 11. Even the king's milk, even the king milks the land of its own profit. Those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. The more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. So what good is wealth except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers? All right, so he goes back to trying things. Next thing he tries is becoming exceptionally wealthy. He says, maybe money will give me meaning outside of God. And while he tries that, uh, he finds that the more you chase after money, the more it disappears. Maybe you'll succeed. Maybe you'll become a rich man. And then after you become a rich man, you'll find that out of the woodwork come all kinds of people to spend your money, and that money will just slip through your fingers. And so then you gotta try again, and you're always pursuing money, and money is perpetual. You will always be going after it. Money, the pursuit of money without God, is meaningless. Now, uh, I think, again, it's important uh, to think about who the author of Ecclesiastes is. Uh, most likely, potentially, we're not 100% sure, but most likely, King Solomon. If King Solomon is the author, then that once again changes the meaning of this particular pursuit that he goes after. 
Let's go back to that man on the street I was talking about before. We asked him, what's the number one thing you know about uh, King Solomon of the Bible? Wisdom. Then we say, could you tell me one more thing? Just try. Rack your brain. What can you think? Tell me one more thing about King Solomon. Probably they would say wealth. And that's because King Solomon was the richest king in Israel's history. No king before or after him was more wealthy. He was exceptionally wealthy. He built the temple, and he did it with extreme decadence, gold, all kinds of crazy things. As people would come to him and ask him for advice, these people would give him treasures as tribute. He had giant castles. He had storerooms full of gold and treasures. He had land and servants. He was the richest king in Israel's history. But not only that, he reigned over the richest period in Israel's history. That means if you went to a random person on the street and figured out how much money they were worth, they would on average be worth more money than any random person in Israel's before or after. It was a time of exceptional wealth for everyone. And yet, he says, the pursuit of money outside of God is meaningless. And this is coming from an exceptionally wealthy man. And you know, I have a, a story from my own life about this one too. It's one of the more interesting things that I've been able to observe happen myself that illustrates this so beautifully. Back in South Africa, uh, most of you will know about apartheid. Apartheid was the system in South Africa where the Afrikaans people oppressed the black people of South Africa. And because of that, it was very difficult for a black man to become wealthy. Very few black people were wealthy during the time of apartheid. And so that meant that all the black people kind of lived in these exceptionally poor neighborhoods, these very, very poor neighborhoods, dangerous, bad. You get the picture. And the Afrikaans, not universally, not all the time, but frequently the Afrikaans lived in nicer neighborhoods, in rich people neighborhoods. So then apartheid was abolished. It was abolished when I was six years old. So I got to see this in real time. I got to see the change. And it changed almost instantly. All of a sudden, uh, the opposite happened. Rich people, black people were able to get rich. In fact, most of the rich people in South Africa today are black, and that's great. And so, uh, all these rich black people moved out of their horrible, dangerous neighborhoods into the rich neighborhoods, the Afrikaans neighborhoods. But, as you probably also know about South Africa, it's a very dangerous country. So the rich neighborhoods have to compensate for the danger, so they're very closed off. They live in gated communities full of guards, armed guards, and their yards are gated off. Their yards are fenced off, and their windows and doors are covered in bars. Now, don't get me wrong, South Africa is a very friendly country. It's very friendly. But you can imagine it's kind of difficult to be good friends with your neighbor when you've got to go through Fort Knox every time you go say hi to them. <laughs> so. The, uh, these, these richer communities are often much quieter, much more closed off, less people around. The opposite is true of the poor neighborhoods. Even to this day, they are vibrant. People on the street, people living out loud. Everybody is in everybody else's business. It's a life of excitement and vibrance. Violent, dangerous, bad things happen to these people all the time, but excitement and vibrance and, you know, everybody's in each other's world. So these uh, people would leave their poor neighborhoods, go to the rich neighborhoods, and hate it. And they would move back. In fact, when I go to the poor neighborhoods now, which I do all the time, yes, I see mostly poor people, but I see giant mansions scattered throughout these poor neighborhoods because these rich people have built their homes in these, rich, in these poor neighborhoods so that they can be a part of the culture, a part of the vibrance. And yeah, I'm sure they pay for it. I'm sure they're robbed all the time. But uh, they get back what they missed. Isn't that a fascinating example of how wealth doesn't bring happiness? They missed what they had when they were poor. All right, so we've looked at four things. And all of them actually kind of entered on a dire note, right? They, he tried all these things one after another. He tries to see if any of these things will make him happy. And one after another, he says to himself, no, 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 it doesn't work. It makes you sad. And if that was the end of the book, if that's how it all ended, I would agree. It's quite a sad, it's quite a dire ending. 
And let's be honest, we look out into our world, we look at the people around us, they're living that life, right? They're having that sad life. That's how they live their life. There is no hope. If that's where the story ended, there is no hope. But we know that's not where the story ends. We know that there is hope. In fact, the author of Ecclesiastes knows there is hope. Let's read together his conclusion to the book. Ecclesiastes 12, two through, uh, 12 through 13. Ecclesiastes 12, 12 through 13. But my child, let me give you some fu further advice. Be careful for writing books is endless and much study wears you out. That's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commandments, for this is everyone's duty. Fear God and obey his commandments. The end of the book kind of goes the same as all the rest of the book. He uh, says, look, here's some other things. Don't do them. They're worthless. Don't worry. But then he gives his conclusion. And his conclusion is, fear God and obey his commandments. How, what's another way of saying that? How can we kind of parse this out a bit? First, fear God. Fear God. What does that mean? Fear God means, look, there is a God, so act appropriately. There's a powerful being in the universe. Acknowledge that. Be fearful. Act appropriately with the knowledge that there is a powerful God in the universe. And second, second he says, obey his commandments. Obey his commandments. What's another way you could say obey his commandments? If you wanted to kind of simplify it, you could say, do what he says. Do what he says. So if you wanted to kind of parse this verse out into a more simple way, you could say this. There is a God. Do what he says. Or because God exists, do what he says. So the book of Ecclesiastes gives us the final hope at the end and the truth that we all know, which is there is a God. There is a Christ. The truths of the Bible are true. These surface-level observations of life aren't true because there is a God. And that changes everything on its head. Everything that we've just read, all four of the points that I've just looked at, change drastically if there is a God. If there is a God then the pursuit of riches for his glory to help him in his kingdom is valuable. It's a valuable pursuit. If there is a powerful God on your side, hardship becomes bearable. If there is a God, then appropriate pleasure, God-given pleasure, is a beautiful thing. And hard work and doing the good things in life become beautiful. And finally, wisdom, if we seek after God, if we seek after him in our knowledge, it's a valuable pursuit. Everything becomes valuable. All we had to do was add God into them. So, how do we finish that up? How do we finish this thought process up together? What's our conclusion? I've got two. First, live with hope. Live with hope. There is hope. There is a God. Everything that we've talked about has meaning because there is a God. Live your life that way. Live with that hope. Let me tell you another story to help you with this. It's about a name, man named Maconia. Maconia is very similar to Masego, I'm sorry, uh, to Cuba, in that they're both uh, awesome Amazayoni men. Maconia, he went to Zeb's, he went through the school that I teach at, and he came to faith. After he went through the program, he came to uh, the missionaries and he said, look, I really want to go to full-time Bible school. And we have a program for that, for men who follow certain requirements and certain kind of special instances. If they want to go on after Zeb's to full-time Bible school, we'll help them. We'll help them. We'll give them some financial help. We'll do some other things. We'll get them there. We'll get them to the finish line of getting that full-time um, uh, Bible degree so that they can do their ministry even more effectively. And so he did that. He went to full-time Bible school, and then he moved into a tiny village in the Eastern Cape. Now, I don't work in the Eastern Cape, so I haven't actually worked with this man much, but I love his story. He moved into this town, and he immediately opened a church, and it started to thrive. It did amazingly. The community was exceptionally happy, but not everybody in the community was happy. A bunch of people weren't. One of the main ones that wasn't was the local witch doctor. South Africa is a country that has a lot of ancestor worship and witchcraft. 
The local witch doctor was furious about this whole church thing. He thought he was going to lose his power. So he gave Makonya a lethal dose of poison. This was a very dark period in our mission. This was a little while ago, about a year ago. He was in the hospital. He was dying. We would get messages from the missionaries in the area on our group chats that were like, he's going to die. He's, you know, apart from a miracle, this man is going to die. But you know what God did? Provide a miracle. That's the only way it could have happened. There's absolutely no way this man should have survived, but he survived. He came through the poisoning, the lethal dose of poisoning. God saved him, and he went straight back to that exact same village. He continued with his church. His church exploded. The local chief gave him bigger land so that he could build a bigger church. Not only that, he started a Sunday school, which let me tell you, Sunday schools are so rare in South Africa, and they are so important. This man started a Sunday school. My mother even was able to go there and see them participating, acting actively in the Christian life, hopefully, God willing, taking them on a path far from where the average person goes in South Africa because of their experience in Sunday school. But do you know what I find kind of most interesting about his return to his small village? Uh, it's a story of a lawnmower. Now, I'm not 100% sure, but I think he's the only guy in his neighborhood that owns a lawnmower. And uh, because of that, he kind of mows a bunch of people's lawns, not just his own. It's part of his ministry. He mows a bunch of people's lawns. Can you guess who is one of those people that he mows their lawn? It's the witch doctor. He mows the witch doctor's lawn. That is a man that has hope. That is a man that serves a powerful God, that knows that a powerful God is on his side. He not only returned to the village of his would-be murderer, he mows his murderer's lawn. That is a God of hope. That is the God that we serve together right now in this room. We have hope. Live that way. And then second, spread the word. Remember, Everything we've been talking about in this lesson, every single thing that I've said today, people are living that life right now out there on the street. They are living that life of hopelessness, and we have the hope. So talk to people. Talk to the people in your life that need to hear it. You know people who are living this way, who are hopeless. Give them that hope. But you know what? Um, As uh, Pastor um, Brady said, God is doing amazing things in South Africa right now. Uh, I'm working now. I'm going to be going back, hopefully, uh, as soon as God allows me to. I'll be running 11 different Bible schools. I will be working in the most populated region of South Africa, in Johannesburg, South Africa. There is a real need there. There are over 2 million Amazayoni. And their lives are changing. When they hear the truth, I always say to people, if you believe in revival, get involved in the Amazoni ministry because God is doing a revival over there. So when I say that we need to spread the word, that there are people who are hopeless, there are two million hopeless people in South Africa right now and in Zimbabwe where I'm also ministering. Help me get back there. Let's pray.